So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lothar Wieske, and I will talk about something I did during the summer, setting up an OpenStack cloud uh, based on, uh, on technology of the Open Compute project. And I will uh, try to fig uh, figure out with you what these architectural considerations about using Open Compute project are. And a bit we um, had to uh, slow down because we had a customer who was uh, still in a very traditional mode of uh, enterprise systems, buying the more expensive stuff on the network and on the store side. So uh, going really big uh, steps was not a way for him to go. So we tried with a difficult uh, strategy uh, going for the network approaches in the Open Compute project first. For me, it would be interesting to see who is familiar with the Open Compute project. Quite some. Because when I talked with uh, other people about that, um, this was not so familiar to people. I uh, got in contact with the Open Compute project uh, very long ago, I think it was 2010, 2011, and uh, there happened uh, a lot of things. What I think is interesting that we have this open source community understanding that the whole approach of open source is not tied to software alone, but can change uh, the hardware market as well. And it cannot in the future, but it already has done now. If you look at what happens to traditional hardware companies, you see that these companies mostly um, lose revenues at about 10% uh, year to year. This is uh, something huge, and we see the workforce changing in that. So going with open source concepts into the hardware market um, changed the whole way how um, hardware <laughs> concepts worked in the data center from the cathedral mode, very process oriented, very rule oriented, <coughs> sorry, uh, to an approach where a lot more self-organization and community building are the major uh, success factors. So, Open Compute Project, I uh, do not want to be that detailed on what it is about. They are essentially disrupting traditional infrastructure. This is another way to say what I just explained. It's not a second type of hardware they are building, they are building new economies, new ecosystems around, another thinking of uh, infrastructure, especially for the so-called hyperscalers. So Facebook was uh, the driving force behind the Open Compute Project. They stepped in uh, in 2009 and decided to do a very modern and very cost saving and from an economical perspective uh, preferable uh, type of infrastructure. And they uh, looked out for a certain data center and they did it for a data center in Oregon. What's more, they did not decide only to build this new data center, but in addition, they decided to make the whole design open source and available to the public. So, not only is it available to everybody, but people have to face that this new design was almost 40% more energy efficient and almost 25% uh, cheaper than what was available before. This is not really uh, stuff that can be compared apple to peaches because um, the architectures you have on such a kind of infrastructure are 
other ones, then you would build it on uh, traditional infrastructure. So this uh, does not only save cost, but it can in some sense uh, drive cost on the uh, side of architecture or as others have put, uh, can open up a strand where you have two types of development and architecture, one for the more hyperscaler stuff and one for the more traditional stuff with a major shift uh, in the future going to this hyperscaler stuff. So we now have an open compute project. This was built in 2011. They build an open compute project foundation so uh, that this is not only uh, bound to interests of Facebook alone. And Facebook is really a front runner in this project because uh, there are many citations who tell that all Facebook data centers now are 100% open compute project compliant. OCP is the usual uh, acronym for open compute project. If you look in detail in Wikipedia, there is some doubt whether this is really the case because um, the citation given there does not really contain this sentence, but I think uh, even if it goes in such a direction that 80% of their data centers are OCP compliant, uh, this is a very, very good uh, success rate. So, if you look at what they announced very early on and what surprised me, they put into uh, news fora and uh, communities that they have a very standardized way to build their data centers. So the whole Facebook has only five types of servers. Five types. If you look at uh, your classical IT department, and uh, some of them have uh, something like shopping carts where you can buy things and have a lot of variations on that. So going down to having really five types of servers and nothing more, you decide to not build anything special even for a price uh, above uh, what you usually have to pay. So this was the first sign in the direction what uh, might come there. I already told that we focused first on uh, network stuff. So not that much on what is available as server designs and storage designs in the Open Compute Project as well, because this can be a bit too much of a change. Because in the Open Compute Project, you have to, uh, this decision where you go into different REC form factors, where you have broader RECs than usual. Usual RECs are 19 inches. Uh, what uh, the Open Compute Project does has 21 inches. This makes it even more difficult to bring this into a traditional data center and traditional managers in IT operations. So we decided to go with network stuff alone. And something like the flagship in the network uh, part of the Open Compute Project is called Facebook Wedge. Wedge 100, because it's a 100 gigabit ethernet technology and they build a design for a, a 32 port top of rack switch it uses Broadcom's uh, Tomahawk ASIC. This is a very usual uh, switching circuit, special uh, hardware, but uh, you find it in many, many switches. The other things are not uh, that um, important for our stuff, so I will skip them. So what we now have is Facebook has a design called Wedge 100. And what can we do with that? The Open Compute Project has uh, had success in the hardware market as well. That means you do not have to take the designs from uh, GitHub 
and try to figure out which manufacturer builds you a chassis, builds you a board and stuff like that, you can simply go to the market and buy this stuff. Edgecore is a company which builds the Wedge 100, a certain variation for that, and this has a quite low price point, and this is a way you can uh, make yourself in an easy way comfortable with the Open Compute project and without building special um, competencies in building hardware, you can buy this stuff. You can buy this stuff for very cheap. Does uh, someone have an idea what uh, such a switch uh, might cost in the actual market? A bit less, 5,000. Because what we now have is the design is open and many, many uh, manufacturers can build this uh, at a scale factor that is tremendous. Because what Amazon, Google, not really building this hardware on their own. They have manufacturers in the back. We do not often know uh, who these manufacturers are, but this is something which is really a matter of mass production today. And that means that the price points for that are very low. And if, for example, you look at Edgecore, they're the mother company of Edgecore called Acton. And Acton is a company who, by now, uh, produces uh, hardware, for example, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So there are connections from the mostly uh, Asian-based uh, companies doing these um, builds uh, to other vendors. So the next slide tells us a bit what this market change is about. What does it mean to disrupt the traditional hardware market? It means going from the proprietary stack in the left column to a new design that is quite common in um, cloud infrastructures. You mostly have those cloth fabrics. Kloss was an engineer, I think it was an American engineer, uh, thinking about uh, telephone switching networks. And he found out that in a certain way, if you build those networks, you can uh, have non-blocking switching networks. That means uh, you have enough connections so that uh, another connection uh, fits on. And this is something which is uh, closely related to how we want to build networks and is uh, the style we have usually today. Because the traditional network infrastructure is very roughly speaking, more optimized to uh, north-south traffic and you have now to um, have designs which support east-west traffic and even greater amounts of east-west tra traffic very well. So you come to these close networks and what we have to do as a transfer right here, because the graphics have very different sources. Um, a cloth fabric has input, the switching part in the middle, and output. Ingress, middle, output. And what you do if you uh, talk about a cloth fabric in the data center networking world is you fold the cloth network. That means input layer and output layer become the same. And uh, this is what we usually have. So the blue boxes on the bottom are input and output. And on the top is um, what's in the middle. And one other type of uh, name you find right here very often is a leaf spine network, where spine is a name for the layer on top and leaf is a name for the um, boxes on the bottom. 
And there are a lot of variations how you can build up these leaf spy networks, and we come to that in a minute. On the right is what really happened in the market and why these effects were quite tremendous. We did not have those uh, components with very high ri uh, price points because network companies who were very experienced uh, let customers pay for that experience. That means they build their own hardware, they build their own software, and want to have a, a high margin on top of that. What the Open Compute Project really did was breaking up this bundle. That means there is a certain manufacturer building the switching chips. This is Broadcom. And there seems to be no company who can go into a real competition with Broadcom. But on the hardware side, you can now take the OCP designs and buy them or similar ones from different hardware companies. And you have as a, a third part of this uh, disaggregation, different companies where you can buy your uh, software driving not only a single switch, but the whole uh, leaf spine network as a layer um, on specialized software coming, for example, from Big Switch or from Cumulus. I did not find Big Switch here. I think they are not here. But Cumulus uh, does something uh, similar. But we will focus here on Big Switch because I did not work that much with Cumulus right now. But I can recommend to you, uh, you can take those ideas and do that with uh, Cumulus networks in an almost uh, identical way, or let's say similar way. So uh, both, uh, both sides of approaching this uh, building a leaf spine layer on top of an OpenStack reference architecture are very similar. So going a bit deeper into that. What Big Switch did is, as part of the Open Compute project, uh, it brought something up which they called Open Network Linux, ONL. This is a traditional Linux distribution, but enriched with respect to components for networking. So this is the network operating system they put as a standard on all those uh, switches coming from uh, OCP. Now you have a guarantee that those bare metal bright box hardware works with an uh, operating system on top of that. And as network devices are different and have their variations, there is not one single network operations driving all those network switches around, but you have certain um, additions that are proprietary. Because finally, what Cumulus does, what Big Switch does, uh, they want to make money, they are companies, um, and uh, want to get uh, a certain revenue and uh, drive their wins in. So what ONL looks like, if we look at it from a perspective of uh, corporation architecture, we have this hardware. Then we have a traditional CPU, which is in uh, today's switches most times uh, Intel-based. And we have this special switch silicon, this ASIC on the right. Then. The stacks are essentially integrated, but they do different things. So um, the Linux kernel on top of the CPU is more from controlling the whole thing. And the part on the switch silicon is more for uh, making the packets fly as quick as they can. This, at some point, is a very special kind of programming because you are programming this special uh, Broadcom ASICs. This is not the way um, general programming usually works. And this has brought uh, some success. So much success that, for example, 
the data center networking um, magic grant from uh, Gartner from uh, July this year. So very actual, very still hot. Has big switch networks, the blue dots a bit uh, lower and a bit more to the left, and cumulus networks on top in this visionary uh, quadrant. And what you see as well is that those classical networking companies you, uh, that come into mind when people talk about data center networking, like Cisco, like Juniper, like Arista, who uh, sell you those components with a higher price point. They are in the uh, quadrant to the right and on the top. But this software-only thing has been quite successful over the years. And all those companies really know what they do. They are in the market for quite some years now. And they have a lot of customers where this software really has to show that it works in, an, uh, in a cloud, in a hyperscaler scenario. So it was our decision to go in th uh, this direction as well. We had a first small prototype built on big switch networks and worked perfect. So we have a layer three leaf spine network. Layer three because you can build uh, leaf spine networks based on layer two or based on layer three. If you build them on layer three and um, make these cho uh, choices like here, uh, is, um, from my point of view, the most scalable way you can think of right now. You go away from, for example, spanning tree in traditional network architectures be, uh, because you have now, as a protocol, uh, ECMP, equally coast multipathing. That means you do not have a protocol uh, eliminating links but ha you have a protocol which enables you to use any available link and uh, with eBGP, you tell uh, those components uh, in the leaf spine network how they can reach each other and how packets can really fly. So what happens to the whole OpenStack thing is that we have two kinds of software-defined network. We have one physical software-defined network made up of big cloud fabric that is the software driving the leaf spine layer, and those white box switches cabled as a leaf spine layer. This is the underlay network, and on top of that, via network virtualization is what we classically built in OpenStack. That means this is built on a VXLAN um, encapsulation, L uh, L2 over L3, and uh, the connectivity with NSXT. We uh, decided to go in that way, but it has a bit to do uh, that the customer had uh, VMware um, deployments and we had to connect between the two. Um, the Big Cloud Fabric BCF and NSXT can be uh, quite easily integrated. So these were uh, the design choices. And we decided to go that way as a minimal viable product. That means going with this network components first and do not doing the complicated stuff going into server designs and storage designs from the Open Compute Project as well. This can come in the future, but we decided to not uh, enforce that right now. The essential OpenStack uh, design is a very usual one. I uh, put up a graphic with the uh, more modern icons for uh, the components. This is again uh, to be understood as a minimal viable product because uh, there are uh, other components which uh, might come on top of that in the near future. For example, uh, analytics stuff uh, built on Sahara or cluster stuff built on Magnum, but these are easily integrated um, 
The more important uh, point of view is that we have defined something like a hardware abstraction layer. A hardware abstraction layer where we have the OpenStack distribution in the middle, multiple hardware vendors with different controller nodes and compute node designs um, where we can choose from or where the customer can choose from because this is interesting from our point of view as an integrator as well. If we do not have uh, to make an offer where we decide which vendor to go with, but if we can uh, leave this uh, decision to the customer, uh, they feel much more com comfortable because usually in customer environments, you find something like, for example, a buying history, um, conflicts with certain vendors, uh, stuff like that. This is not technically re related, but if you make a design who fixes one vendor, then it might be uh, a, a reason for the customer to not go with your offer, and so we made it a, a lot more general. On the storage side, we decided to go with Ceph. This is nothing uh, uh, surprising in the OpenStack world as well. It was a very good decision in uh, that respect because uh, they had very traditional storage vendors. Do not want to mention the name, but everybody can imagine. And if, for example, you look at how do they support the image protocol of uh, OpenStack, the block protocol of OpenStack, and the file protocol, especially Manila, were, were, uh, was, a pro uh, was a problem for them. Then you find this uh, support is not existing or unclear or left uh, moved from the uh, vendor to the community, all of that stuff. And the only stable thing we, can, we could uh, recommend was to go with Ceph. And we have on the left side this hardware abstraction uh, working through Big Switch Cloud Fabric and multiple hardware vendors for the switching hardware as well. So if you look at the side of uh, Big Switch Networks, you find that you can choose uh, from quite some uh, technologies, the fastest being uh, 100G, 32 ports, I think there are um, hardware devices available right now uh, supporting uh, 64 ports of 100G. So um, this um, whole uh, world is uh, changing uh, quite fast in that way. And if you look at the open networking suppliers, um, the manufacturers of those bright boxes and white boxes, we find quite some icons. We find very familiar ones, like Dell, like Hewlett Packard. And this works that way, that Big Switch Networks uh, does certification for these network products. So you do not really uh, read in a brochure. This might support open network Linux, but this is a matter of certification. And we decided to only recommend to our customer the, um, the ones in the yellow box right there, because these are the gold certified um, devices. So we can be very sure that Open Network is running on that. So our essential design was like that. We had um, three sides each with three fire protection areas. The three fire protection areas come from the uh, Ceph part because we wanted with a replication factor of one plus two, having a design where even if a um, fire protection area goes down, we have the whole site um, surviving and recoverable. We have the network layer on top we have the compute layer in between and have the storage uh, component right uh, below. And I left those boxes in the middle out because I think if you want to build something similar, then this is something like a breathing design. In the one uh, situation, you have to provide more storage. 
In the other situation, you have to provide more uh, compute. But what I have at the final slides in this talk is that from our buy, uh, purchase list, I brought the uh, network device specification, the compute uh, device specification, and the storage um, specification. And if you uh, would like more details, uh, we can mail about that. So this is open material. I will not talk about uh, vendors in another detail level uh, than I have here. And I cannot tell uh, who the customer is. Uh, this is uh, clear, for, uh, of course. But um, I went to our purchase design uh, department with exactly this list. And they were very happy because usually they get a list where people are told, you have to buy, for example, from uh, HP server X, XYZ, exactly uh, 16 cores and uh, 256 uh, gigabyte of RAM. And this usually leads uh, to not that many offers and not really uh, having a competition between those different vendors. Though they really like the style that I, uh, on the open network switch level, only told about recommended candidates because of what the certification status is. And on the other hand, uh, only talk, uh, talking about uh, qu uh, quantitative measures. And compute nodes is a bit higher one, not the one rec unit form factor, but um, uh, the compute node is again a one rec unit uh, factor uh, connected with two times uh, 25 gigabit ethernet. We have those uh, 100 gigabit uh, ethernet uh, switches on top. That means each port is divided into four. So we have a very high speed interconnect for the uh, compute nodes and we have an even uh, greater um, speed at the storage nodes because I decided to make the NIC for storage nodes having even four of these ports. So uh, saturating our storage nodes is something which we were not successful with because this is a bleeding edge, so to speak. This would uh, be my talk. Um, maybe we have time for two or three questions. Um, we had uh, in the very beginning a part where I talked, uh, asked about the components. So the network device is, if you look at the internet, and uh, you have uh, the network device, you have the Sorry. <laughs> I just talked about how the price points are. Um, and if you, if you look at a price point for the hardware at about 50,000, then the price point of the software per switch is almost the same. So this is another price point than uh, what you get if you look into the um, pricing sheets of uh, the bigger vendors in the top right quadrant of the um, Gartner Magic quadrant. So thank you very much. If you would have questions or uh, want to have the slides or whatsoever, uh, just mail me. I cannot uh, give you every detail of this customer engagement, but a lot of that. And I tried my best to abstract it in a way that I can talk about it to a greater audience. Thank you.